Something else that's absolutely essential is the importance of touch. Um, people, as they get older, tend to become more socially isolated. And just something simple, just me putting my hand on, on her hand or my hand on her arm. In her case, I would hug her a lot. But just, it would just you would just watch her melt at, at, the, at, the, at the impact of a touch. So, so important. Um, what I found in Jeannie's case, this is not universal with all people with Alzheimer's, but in many cases, their brain is slowly rewinding. And we've all heard stories of how they no longer recognize their daughter. They think it's their mother or their aunt. Mm -hmm. um, as, as someone would regress to where they're now, instead of in their 70s, they're back to their 30s. Well, this woman walking in who's 45 couldn't possibly be my daughter because I'm 15 years younger than she. Therefore, she's my mother, she's my aunt, she's someone older. Um, so trying to understand that part of it was, was, was challenging. Um, in Jeannie's case, emotions were the very last thing to go. Um, logic at this point was pretty much shot toward the end. Um, but her feelings were always there. And, and something that you, you taught me is that although she might not remember me visiting her, she's going to remember the feeling that she had while we were together. And th those feelings would linger. And so my, my goal was to just get her as happy as possible whenever I'd see her so she'd have a smile on her face and a song in her heart. Um, and those feelings would, would, would continue. And I think what's, what's uh, important for a caregiver to know that um, when you put yourself in that positive frame of mind to give that positive energy yeah. to the individual, you kind of get it yourself. Oh, absolutely. You walk out the door, uh, maybe of a, a, something you were dreading doing, but you find that you've got a little skip in your step and your you know that same energy has kind of come back and also another thing i think that's important is you know we we um i think about the chin where you know not talking to your chin getting to the level not just touch but getting to the level where you're not standing over a person talking down to mm -hmm. them and i have a feeling a hug is a great way to do that or just standing next to yep. a person kind of getting into the the um getting into their space but not, not um, if the person is seated, not having the conversation while you're standing Absolutely. and they're yeah. seated because that just has an energy of, of a power over energy that's not, yep. Yep. not easy to take. Probably the single most important lesson that my wife taught me with her Alzheimer's is that all she had was the moment. She had no yesterdays. She, we couldn't count on the tomorrows. All she had was the time that we were sitting there with each other. And that, that's been a spiritual lesson I've been trying to grasp for years now of, of living in the now and not projecting, not reflecting, but just to be in the present moment. And that was just an invaluable lesson that she taught me. And, and for that, I thank her. So now we're going to get to some heavy stuff. Um, many things happened within a very short period of time um, where I realized that I could no longer keep my wife home. Um, First, my depression had gotten so bad that I, I, I couldn't even get out of bed some mornings. I, I had difficulty breathing. I was crying a lot. Uh, my boss at work said, you know, you're, you're hired to run a program. We understand all that you're going through with your wife. But the reality is you come to work and you sit there. You're not able to function. Not a good sign. Um, I was having great difficulty sleeping. Some of it was, I'm sure, the depression. Some of it was sleeping very lightly because if she would get up during the night, I had to be up with her. Mm -hmm. Um, subsequently, I was taking more and more medications to help me th through this. Um, I had taken an online caregiver stress test. And unfortunately, I answered yes to every last question. And I realized that I'm in a burnout situation. Um, the last couple weeks that Jeannie was home, she had three different falls. Times where she would just trip over or fall down. Each time, there was someone with her at the time. I was with her twice, uh, Dory was with her once, um, and in spite of everything that we're doing, she would still fall. And that was very, very concerning to me. Um, the last time she fell, I was at work, Dory called me to say, I have to take your wife to the, the hospital, her arm is all torn up. By the time I got home, they had just returned from the hospital, and Jeannie was bandaged from wrist to elbow, and blood was seeping through the bandage. And I looked at her and I, I, I got all teary and I said, Jeannie, what happened to you? And she looked down at her arm. She said, well, I have absolutely no idea what happened. And I started crying. And I said, 
up until now, I've been able to, to help you, to protect you, to do whatever I needed to do to help keep you here. And I got to tell you, at this point, I'm, I'm helpless. I've run out of tools in my toolkit. I have nothing more to give you. And she turned to me, and she'd said this before, but this was the most impactful time. She, she put her hand on my arm, and she said, Mo, what would happen to me if something were to happen to you? Mm -hmm. And it was just a, a knock me down with a feather. So that night, I emailed many friends, including you, and I asked two questions. I said, when do you know if it's time, and what kind of things can I expect? Every single person returned the email immediately, and each of them said, if you have to ask that question, it's time. And know that it'll be far more difficult for you than it will be for her. Well, that's what comes to me when I hear that part of the story that you were so traumatized by this fall. Um, and she, not, she didn't even remember, she wasn't. No. So <clears throat> it, you might not have been able to notice that at the time, you were more feeling that you couldn't keep her safe no matter what. But what I, he, what I see when I hear that is that you were living the what ifs. And also, though she could be right in the moment, she was fine in that moment. She didn't remember how she felt. She wasn't right. worried about falling again, but you were living all of that. And that's another indication that, well, it's an, for me, it's an idea, what I think about is that we dread the idea of a nursing home, but in fact, it's, it's, not, it's not always a bad choice. Sometimes it's a really good choice. Initially, I felt like I was a total failure that I could not, with all my skills and all my love and all my, my abilities, I could not keep my wife at home. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this was very difficult for me. Um, so I went out looking at nursing homes and I had certain criteria. I, I learned enough about Alzheimer's to know that the people caring for my wife needed to have special training for Alzheimer's. That although many nursing homes believe it's perfectly okay to keep Alzheimer's patients with non-Alzheimer's patients, I didn't feel comfortable with that whatsoever. I was fortunate enough to find one nursing home in Greenfield that had a locked Alzheimer's unit. I went and, and looked at the facility. I talked to several friends who had family members there, and I decided that that's where Jeannie needs to go. So let me get clear about this. A locked unit does not mean that the person can't ever leave the unit. It, it just means that the door is locked so that they cannot leave if they, if they choose to. They're not going to gonna wander. Right, But, right. you know, was she able to have dinner, for example, in a dining room with yeah. a mixed and population? And I was able to come and take her out. Take and, her out. Yeah, but just, mm -hmm. it just she could not leave on her own accord. Mm -hmm. there, someone had to escort her through the door. So uh, I want to back up just a little bit uh, because the other thing that, that I think is important is that the denial piece of this, that it's not just that you'd failed her, but this was your retirement home. Yeah. Perfect house for the two of you to grow old together. So there's a loss also that's happening, and it, you could no longer deny the progressive aspect of this condition. Yeah. So there's, there's a, uh, a huge loss when we have to give up denial, yeah. really saying, okay, this is progressive. We aren't going to live out our retirement years together here. Uh, that's sometimes I think that the primary caregiver kind of holds on maybe hoping for that miracle or maybe if I just don't look at it it'll go away so it's it's not just for um, failing her as a caregiver but accepting the fact that the plans that you'd had for life yep. you had to face all of that in making this decision they say if you want to make God laugh tell her your plans mm -hmm. and it was, it was it was very difficult so at this point, I checked out the nursing home. I had, uh, uh, she was on a waiting list. I had scheduled a, a little uh, one-day trip to Boston for the two of us. Um, and uh, a couple days earlier, I got a phone call from the nursing home within a week probably of me putting her name in saying, we have a bed for you. I said, I wasn't ready for this. First of all, it was difficult. I, I said, let me call you back in a little bit. I went out to my car and I cried for about 15 minutes and came back and said, um, I've, I've planned this trip. We're going to go next Monday. Is it possible to hold that room so that uh, Tuesday she can mm -hmm. come? They said, fine, that's, that's fine. So we went to, to Boston, had a wonderful visit. Um, on the trip back from Boston, I asked her how much she enjoyed the trip, and she said, oh, Mo, I haven't been to Boston since I went <laughs> to college. She had no memory of having gone there. Um, Jeannie's, uh, one of Jeannie's daughters came to the house, and she and I gathered all kinds of, of 
items that Jeannie would, would recognize easily, and we, we decorated her room with photographs and, and uh, little stuffed animals and, and bed quilts so that the day I, I was going to take her in, it was all set up for her. So the day she ended up in the nursing home, I, that morning we went out for breakfast, and after breakfast we went to, uh, to a very secluded spot and we had a talk, and I said, do you remember how you told me how um, you were concerned that if anything were to happen to me, mm -hmm. what would happen to you? I said, it's really reached that point where I just, I can't take care of you any longer, and you need to have someone with you 24 hours a day, and I can't do that. And I've given this tremendous thought. I've talked to the family, and we've decided that the best place for you is for you to go into a nursing home. And she said, well, isn't there something we can do? Can you maybe hire someone to come up to the house and spend time with me when you're not home? I said, well, you know, we've tried that for the last year and a half, and that's just no longer working. And my blessed wife turns to me, and she said, well, Mo, if you feel that's what I need, then that's what I need. Took her to the nursing home, went into her room. She looked around and said, oh, I recognize these pictures and those plants, and, the, the, and she felt comfortable. I was told prior to bringing her into the nursing home to coordinate a story with family and, and staff. And her story was that because she had all these falls going on, that she needed to have constant rehabilitation to get stronger. And also, she's this exemplary counselor. And I said, there's a lot of people in the nursing home who are very lonely. And your job is to seek these people out, sit down with them, put your hand on theirs, and let them know that they're loved, that there's someone out there. And she, she easily took on those roles. It was splendid how she just assimilated herself. Mm -hmm. the, the people in the nursing home called her Nurse Jeannie. And uh, they even set up a dummy file for her. So they would write some notes. It was actually the same notes they'd keep giving her day after day. And she'd pull out the file. The, the patient's name was Hans Solo. And she would transcribe the, the medical records into the file. And she felt very useful. And she did a lot of the counseling with other patients uh, many, many times. It was pretty wonderful. I want to back up to something sure. that I, I meant to earlier. Um, so I think in fairness to the family, when people, when you say aren't a the family wasn't able to support you with this, I think that the idea that it's every single day so maybe they say, well, I could come on this Sunday or I could come on that afternoon. But the idea that, that um, when you ask for support with this condition, it really has to be consistent and, it, and it's a 24-hour need. And um, sometimes people just aren't able to see that because the person seems so functional. Yeah, and that's what happened, too. It's a you know, her, her son would spend an hour with her in the afternoon and call me up and say, well, I don't know what the big deal is. Right. Mom was fine. Mm -hmm. And she remained social to the very last day on this planet. Mm -hmm. um, and at family dinners or, yeah. you know, other events. Um, I, I had meant to say that earlier, but something just reminded me of it again yeah. now. So I think that's, that's an important um, thing to note, that you as the primary caregiver know that you really need to have continuous care. But the person coming in for that continuous care can feel after an hour, there's really no need for me to be here. Exactly. I, what am I doing here? Well, I had a family meeting with the kids. And um, I told them what I was going through. And, and one of the sons said, well, you know, I, could, I can come up every other Sunday and spend an hour with her and give you an opportunity to go up maybe two hours. And then a, a, one of the daughters said, in, in the Sundays that he doesn't come up, I can come up. And I explained to them that one or two hours is nowhere near enough. Mm -hmm. it's, it's days that I need off. I, I was eligible to receive uh, respite grants from both Alzheimer's mm -hmm. Association and Franklin County Home Care mm -hmm. so I could take off for a weekend and hire someone and I never took advantage of those. So it was so hard for me to let go of her. Mm -hmm. And if I was gone, I'd just be thinking about her. So there was little reason for me to, uh, to take advantage of that, which is just more of, of how I was undermining my own health by doing this. So now with Jeannie in the facility, in your home, yeah. how, how did your life change? Well, the good news is she was close enough that I could visit her every day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it'd just be a matter of a few minutes and sometimes it'd be a matter of hours. Sometimes we'd go out for a ride or we'd go out for lunch. Um, but I came home and I'd walk through this big empty house that was indeed could be our retirement home. And I had no idea how to fill my life up for so many years. I had been dedicating all my conscious time to taking care of my wife, and I no longer had that. And so it was a matter of, of re-identifying what my own personal needs were. And it gets a little bit stronger, because I want to talk about August 15th. Okay. I, I get a phone call from the nursing home. 
saying that Jeannie had been vomiting all night and they were concerned that she was dehydrating and they wanted her to go to the hospital, to the emergency room, so they could put her on IVs to bring up her fluid level. Now, was this the first time that she had gone to the ER from the hospital, she I mean, had, from the nursing she home? She had been there at least a half dozen times. Mm -hmm. She'd had falls, she had, uh, one time she had a pulmonary embolism that wasn't that huge, but noteworthy. Um, so I was kind of used to these phone calls and dehydration was no big deal. I wasn't all that concerned mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. it. And even though she was in the facility, they couldn't stop those falls either, right? No, they, no. they couldn't prevent the falls. Well, she only fell once in the nursing mm -hmm. home. But um, she fell at home. I think that's, I always feel like that's fair to point out that, that um, falls happen. It's not the yeah. fault of the caregiver. No, no, no. Sometimes they can't be prevented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this particular morning she was vomiting. Yep. Yeah. so I, I go to the emergency room and they already knew me by name. And uh, the doctor came in and is very solemn. He says, we just did a CAT scan on your wife and she has a, she's having a cerebral hemorrhage. She's having a brain bleed. He says, there's nothing we can do to stop it. She will not survive the day. The good news is she has no pain. Uh, this was about nine o'clock in the morning. So mm -hmm. I contacted the family and told them what's going on. Uh, those who live locally were able to come and spend the day with her. Each of us had our time to spend with her individually. <clears throat> you came that evening, thank you so much, so very much for being there at the time. And um, that evening, Jeannie made her final transition. Um, I came home that night and I, I wrote an email and it said, my dearest friends, I'm writing to inform you that my precious genie passed into spirit this evening following a severe cerebral hemorrhage. We were all blessed for many reasons. She experienced no pain. She was surrounded by family. She died within 12 hours of the brain bleed. She continued while a patient in the nursing home to counsel other patients. Staff called her nurse genie. In spite of her advancing Alzheimer's, she never forgot her family's names. That was my biggest dread, that I'd walk in one day and she didn't mm -hmm. know who I was. She didn't need to die of Alzheimer's 10 years from now. She taught me that the moment, this moment, is all that we really have. We are so blessed to have been with her, to have known her, and to love her. She did it her, herself to living a life of service and touching others' lives. It was an honor for me to be able to serve her. With deepest blessings, Mo. And I sent that out to everyone we knew. As I'm finishing up the email, I very gently felt my arm being brought across my chest and my other arm brought over on my other shoulder and my head was lowered and I saw this huge golden sheer cloth, if you will, I don't know what it was, slowly descend, fell over me, gently wrapped itself around me and then I started feeling love pouring through the top of my head, through my body, pouring out of my arms, out of my, my fingers, out of my toes, just, just immersed in love. And I started laughing. And I said, Jeannie, you've only been on the other side of the curtain for like two hours and already you're learning some of the many, many, many tricks. So after that, we had a, a remarkable memorial service for her. And um, now I'm in the process of trying to figure out who I am, what my needs are, because it's nothing I've looked at for a really long time. So probably the most important thing I've chosen to do is to share my story, to let people know that they are empowered, that as terrible as this illness is, there are ways of turning it into a positive event to grow from the experience and to not feel like you're a victim from it. Well, thank you, Mo, for telling that oh, story. Thank you, Sue, for listening. Um, I have a, a few things that I'd like to say about um, the organization that I work for, Trip Community Care Collaborative, a local nonprofit created to support elders and their caregivers all along the continuum. Uh, not, we don't provide any direct service or compete with any existing service. Our goal is to provide support, whatever kind of support. It might be a referral, it might be helping to assess a situation, helping to develop a care plan. But one of the programs that, our newest program that I'm really excited about is a coaching program where someone with your experience or nursing experience or rehab experience would be playing the role of coach to a caregiver uh, in a, a home situation. And um, we have just gotten a new office in Greenfield at 277 Main Street, and we will be developing that 
care giving coaching support program and also just helping to kind of negotiate this labyrinth that can happen when you enter the the um, the caregiver role at whatever whatever entry point so I'd like to give a little um, uh, contact information for Trip Community Care Collaborative at 277 Main Street. And I have to look at our number because it's brand new. It's 413-774-3380. We're in the process of building a website. That's not out there yet, but it will be. And <clears throat> we also do, through Greenfield Community College, we do certified nursing assistant training and home health aid training and personal care attendant training. And that number at GCC is 413-775-1672. Can you repeat both those numbers a little bit slower, please? Yes, I can. 413-774-3380 is the TRIP office. And for seven, yes, 413-775-1672 is the Greenfield Community College CNA program. And also, we have an audience this evening, and I wonder if there are any questions. Anyone have anything they'd like to say before we finish? I guess we've just covered yeah, thank everything. Thank you all for coming. Well, it's a great story. Thank you, thank you. Um, so if people want to contact me to help them negotiate the system, please call 774 Three three eight zero. It'll be handled through your your the Trip Foundation. Sometimes it's just the uh, a voice at the other end of the phone. Sometimes it's helping to just talk something through. Mostly it's it's um, well. Sometimes you need a nurse to actually come over to the house and say, "How can I help with bathing?" Or um, is it time for foot care? Or you know, any, any number of things, repositioning a person. One thing that Mo said that's important is that Jeannie didn't die of Alzheimer's disease. The disease is progressive. So one of the things, one of the blessings for you all is also that you didn't have to be providing the total care that eventually can happen. So just learning how to bathe and help with mouth care and feeding and eating, dietary issues. We have a nutritionist that works with us. We have a massage therapist. Um, that can just not do it for you. This isn't a home care agency that will um, come out and provide the care. These will be caregivers, skilled, experienced individuals like yourself who will coach the family member or, or the privately paid caregivers along. And you get to determine what your needs are. We help, but you get to determine what your needs are. Yes? Um, you said that you would do referrals. Mm -hmm. the question so the question I'm going to repeat the question um, about referrals and do we uh, we we make referrals the question is where do we start it might be with diagnosis uh, we we um, and we might not if we don't know we'll find out but wherever you are along the continuum we we will figure that out where you are now and where you need to be and it might, be, um, it might be that you're ready for diagnosis. And we would, it might be that, that um, the, I'm trying to, there are so many different examples. But we would help with referrals both to agencies to, we would like to get to a point where we would help find personal care attendants in a more formal way, but also to make a referral. You had mentioned, Mo, that you had to fire a provider. So maybe you might be able to help people to know how, where to start and how to find a good provider. We also have a group of people uh, in the Greenfield area who are capable of doing a full assessment. We have a, mm -hmm. a psychotherapist, we have a nurse practitioner, we have a, a neuropsychologist, and when they're through testing the person, we have a, a very, as, as close to an accurate diagnosis as possible, if indeed it's Alzheimer's or not. Mm -hmm. And I strongly encourage people to not assume because mom can't find her teeth this morning that it's Alzheimer's. She mm -hmm. must be properly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, do not try to do this on your own. You can't possibly do what has to be done. You must ask for help. It's really okay to do that. 